Climate change is very much on the agenda of international business and trade at the Asian Financial Forum 2010. We have the father of carbon trading. Dr. Richard Sando is from the Chicago Climate Exchange, and thanks indeed for joining us. Now, really looking at the sort of trades that there are, how do they actually work? Well, it is essentially a cap and trade, much in the spirit of the EU. In our case, it's legally binding, but voluntary. We have about 450 members, 110 or so emitters, 17% of the Dow Jones, 11% of the Fortune Top 100, 22% of the power sector, cities, states, etc. They include all the blue chip names, IBM, Intel, DuPont, Ford, Honeywell, American Electric Power, etc. So it covers an, an incredibly broad cross-section of American industry. As a matter of fact, the tonnage, that is the baseline, for the program is 670 million tons and that would make it about 33 percent of all of Europe even though there is no legislative mandate. But the fact is that this exchange is very much a real exchange. There are liquidity providers, those people who actually have nothing to do with carbon emission reductions but have everything to do with carbon trading. The liquidity providers are indeed market makers. As we know in all markets, whether they are in North America, Europe, Hong Kong, the buy and sell orders are not exactly timed. So a liquidity provider will importantly bridge the gap so that naturals, that is hedgers, can find a contraparty at a given time. So let's now turn to the Copenhagen Agreement, which took place quite recently. Now, this uh, is not really a legally binding agreement, but what's your view about it? I think the Copenhagen Accord, and it's not an agreement, is really terrific. It really builds momentum. For the first time, we are witnessing not only the Europeans involved, but America, China, India, Brazil. So it's the first time we're seeing all of the major countries in the world coming around to discuss the issue of emissions. Well, China has really looked at the idea of lowering carbon intensity, but what about the emissions themselves? Is it good enough really to be talking about intensity rather than emissions? I think we have to recognize that this is the first time China has come to an international agreement with a reduction in carbon intensity. I view this as a bridge. If we take a look at the European experience of the European Union, it started with the coal and steel agreement, it went to a common market, it went to a European Union, and finally a single monetary system. We believe that carbon trading will evolve among sovereign nations around the world and that we will have what I would like to call a plurilateral trading regime. Ultimately, markets in Europe, North America, China, India, Japan, and each of those nations will ultimately be linked by some sort of financial instrument like a certified emission reduction. I think the optimism that it was expressed by President Obama, Senator Kerry, Senator Luger's office, uh, which thought it was a home run, Kerry saying that it would lead to more activity in the United States. I think we have to look at the positive accentuate the fact that this will spur activity in nations around the world and evolve like many other international agreements. And looking at a legally binding framework, when would you expect that to take place, if at all? Well, I think what's most important is that sovereign nations will take action. I do believe there will be something 
in the United States in the not too distant future. I do believe that we will see voluntary efforts in China. We formed the Tianjin Climate Exchange in partnership with the China National Petroleum Corporation. We're talking to a lot of companies in India. We already work with companies like Tata on auctioning their particular reductions. So I think the international agreement will follow the actions of specific sovereign nations. And this accord in Copenhagen will have a powerful influence on getting individual countries to start looking at cap and trade. And very importantly, a market was endorsed in Copenhagen, and I think that will reverberate through capitals around the world. And when we're talking about carbon trading, do you see Asia, in particular China and India, really setting themselves up and really knitting into the regime for carbon trading? I do believe Asia is making progress. It's not only the markets, it's the technological innovation, the development of wind power, alternative sources of energy, biomass. So it's a combination of a cap and ultimately price driving changes in industrial behavior and spurring on inventive activity. And again, it's very important for us to emphasize that whether it's industrial inventions or financial innovations, they evolve over time. I am feeling very optimistic that China and India will play an incredible role in not only economic growth, but one that is sustainable and will serve and help job growth, technology changes, and in fact, a cleaner and greener Asia. Nothing that we've seen in history suggests that all of a sudden an invention occurs and it's immediately adopted. There will be first movers, there will be voluntary efforts, but ultimately I'm extraordinarily bullish about China and India and the progress they will be making in addressing greenhouse gases. Well, you'll be attending the Asian Financial Forum here in Hong Kong in 2010. So what's your view about what this venue can achieve, really looking at carbon emissions? Well, I'm very excited about coming to Hong Kong to discussing the work that we're doing in Europe with the European Climate Exchange, <clears throat> in the United States with the Chicago Climate Futures Exchange, in Canada with the Montreal Climate Exchange, in Australia with NVEX, and most importantly, to go over what progress we have made in China in developing institutional capability, human capital, the formation of the exchange, the support of the China National Petroleum Corporation, also the work we're doing in India with Terry. I'm on the advisory board of that school. I've worked closely with Regenda Pachuri, and I'm very proud, very, very proud to be part of an effort in Asia, and I think Asia will emerge as quickly as it did with growth. It will take time, but there will be unambiguously a sustainable China and a sustainable India in all of our futures. Dr. Richard Sander, thanks indeed for joining us. And he's with us at the Asian Financial Forum 2010 here in Hong Kong.